Good morning, Flag Church. Man, you look good this morning. The lights are coming up, and you look like you're wide awake and ready to go this morning. Um, hey, I just want to kind of echo what's happening with Mega Sports Camp. Uh, you know, Jalen Davis, our kids pastor, she's overseeing Mega Sports Camp, but it's actually being spearheaded by one of our Pitt State students, Rogelio Cardenas. Uh, you know him as Ro. He was up here a couple weeks ago and uh, shared a bit of his, his story. And uh, we're excited for that. We're excited to incorporate uh, our Pitt State students into the life of the church. You know, gang, th this doesn't happen that often that a college ministry is really incorporated in, into intergenerational ministry. And there's something really magical that happens when a young adult like Roe is leading a ministry like this, Mega Sports Camp, along with obviously uh, Pastor Jalen. But there's something really magical and really powerful about that. When kids see role models, children see role models in that generation just ahead of them and uh, see that investment in their lives. And we believe in the next generation. We believe that God is raising up a generation that's going to be more biblically literate uh, than my generation, that's going to be more spirit-filled than my generation, more faith-filled than my generation. And I'm excited to see God work in the next generation. We're going to see some really incredible things happen at Mega Sports Camp and also at our camps. I just want to, I don't want to redo the announcements, but I just want to maybe emphasize and put an exclamation point here. If you would, as you think about it this week, as you're having lunch, if you would just remember to pray for the bunch at lunch this week, that you just pray that God would touch our students while they're at high school camp, they're going to have an experience this week that really could be life-altering. The number of students that we see uh, commit their hearts to Christ and experience the infilling of the Holy Spirit and sense, uh, get a sense of God's call on their lives, uh, whether it's for ministry or whether it's for some other vocation, however they, can, they believe God has called them to serve him for the rest of their lives. Those things happen often at camp. So if you would just, as you, as you sit down uh, to lunch this week, if you just remember the bunch at lunch, uh, you can have an impact on their lives. Well, let's dig into the scripture this morning. Are you ready? If you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 13. It'll be projected on the screen. Also, you can uh, click onto our app. This is the international sign for app. I, whenever I say app, I do this. I don't know why. Um, but you can uh, open up our app and you can actually study uh, along with us, read along with us in the notes on the app if you'd like to do that. John chapter 13, verse 1. We read, and it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he'd come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Heavenly Father, I pray that today you would help us to really enter into the experience that the disciples had at this initiation, this reconfiguring, this reshaping of the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. And this pivotal moment in the history of not just the church, but the history of humanity. Lord, help us to understand more fully what you were communicating to your disciples in those moments, those powerful, powerful moments, and help us to enter into that experience so that our lives would be changed, that we'd look more like Jesus. We ask it in his precious name. Amen.
Amen. Amen. So we just read a, a pretty familiar passage of Scripture. You've probably read this story before if you're a Christ follower. It's John's record of the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. And John's record is, is a little less specific. You know that there are four Gospels, right? Each Gospel is kind of written to a, a different audience with a different purpose. It's kind of interesting that, that uh, God made sure that the Gospel was written just as a reminder that the Gospel's for everybody. And there are different perspectives that are going to come. You each each of us brings a different perspective to the Gospels. There are four different Gospels for that very purpose. Different purposes, sharing the story of Jesus. God recognizes that all of us come at this differently. All of us need to hear it differently. And John's record is, is a little bit unique even among the four Gospels. The other three Gospels are called Synoptic Gospels. And they're a little bit more inclusive of all of Jesus' life. But the Gospel of John really focuses on this last portion of Jesus' life, and specifically on the last week of Jesus' life as he headed toward the cross and became a sacrifice for us. But John's record of the Lord's Supper is a little less specific. It, it's the only record that records, uh, that, that notes the, the washing of the disciples' feet. It, it records Jesus' interactions with Judas much more specifically. Interestingly, it doesn't really record Jesus' blessing and distribution of the elements. It's, it's just a different take on this critical, critical meal that Jesus ate with his disciples before he went to the cross. To find the other description, we can go to Matthew chapter 26, and we read there, in, starting in verse 26, where it says, and as they were eating, this is a different description, same meal. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Jesus is talking about comparing himself to the old covenant where there were sacrifices and the shedding of blood for, so that people could temporarily experience the forgiveness of sin. But, but he's explaining, no, this is a new covenant. It's a permanent covenant. You don't have to have a sacrifice over and over and over again like they did in the Old Testament with bulls and goats and all of those things, the, the entire sacrificial system. Jesus is really saying, hey, the sacrificial system was pointing to me. And he says, this is, this is the blood of the new covenant, my blood, which is a new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Anybody thankful this morning for the forgiveness of sin? That's what Jesus is talking about. And he says here, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And interestingly, Matthew wraps up this account of the Lord's Supper, he says in verse 30, and when they'd sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So we see this transition from the Lord's Supper and Jesus moving toward his suffering and ultimately his crucifixion. You know the story probably that the soldiers came out and, and arrested him while he was praying in the, in, at the Mount of Olives. And John's version of this story differently than Matthew's version of the story, shows a, a, a bit of the, the relational context that Jesus had with his disciples. It digs a little bit deeper into those relationships. As we look at Jesus' example here, we see a, a couple of things, and, 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 and I think we can kind of understand this as Jesus is the host of the meal. And yet, even as he's the host, he's the servant of the meal. And it was unheard of that a host would actually wash the feet of those who were his guests. Why? Because that's a, a lowly thing to do. But Jesus serves as, as the host. And you know, spiritual leadership really involves hosting. There's a book that's now out of print. It's by Tim Elmore. It's, it, it, I wish it wasn't out of print because it, it's, it's an incredible read. The book is called Soul provider, S-O-U-L, provider, soul provider. 
And in that book, he talks about spiritual leadership. And one of the points that he makes is that spiritual leaders are hosts. That is that, that when we lead spiritually, we're, we're providing hospitality as though people were in our home. When someone walks into our home, we're concerned about what? We're concerned about their comfort. We're concerned about their needs being met. We're concerned about them first. Uh, uh, if someone walks into your home, if, if they're I understand you may have some very, very familiar friends that you might do this with, but if it's a new individual in your home, you're hosting them, you're not going to let them sit in the living room and you go get a bowl of cereal and pour the milk on it and bring it back out and eat in front of them. That's not what you do. Why? Because you're hosting them. You're more concerned about their needs. You might say, do you need a glass of water? Do you need, would you like a cup of coffee? Would you like something to eat? You're, you're hosting them. You're concerned about their needs. And, and Elmore makes the point, he says, that that's really what spiritual leadership is about. Leaders eat last. We're more concerned about the other person. And I'd submit to you that in that same way that you and I, as spiritual leaders, host relationships, we host relationships in our families, we host relationships in ministry, we host relationships in community. That kind of leadership can, can take place w when we're at a family gathering or, or when our family's together. Uh, in, in the church, we, we can be spiritual leaders. You may say, well, I'm not, I'm not a spiritual leader. Listen, if you have given your heart to Christ, you are now on mission. You're now, you say, I, I, I don't want that responsibility. Too late. You're part of the family. And as family members, we have this responsibility to provide spiritual leadership. We host relationships in our families, in the church, in the community, in the workplace, with our friends, in all of those, all of those situations. That you may be saying, well, I'm not sure I really get all of this. Well, just, just a for instance, if you're a husband or a dad in the room, this means that it's your responsibility to host those relationships. Why? Because you're a spiritual leader. It doesn't mean that you pray over every meal, but it does mean that you make sure that somebody prays over every meal. It doesn't mean that you do everything, that, that you sit down and do a devotional for your family and you're the only one that ever does it because you're... No, being a leader means you're hosting the relationship. It means that you're making sure that there's a spiritual component in every relationship, that you're making sure that the other person's needs are being met, especially their spiritual needs. It's, it's ours. Why? Because we're spiritual leaders. You're the spiritual host in all of those situations. And that, that kind of spiritual leadership can make you weary. It can wear you out because you're concerned about other people. You're mindful of other people. But that really is the Christ life, that we put others first, that we're mindful of other people. Now, it requires our own soul care. We've talked about this before, but if, if you've ever flown, you remember the, that... When the oxygen drops, you're supposed to put the mask on the other person first. Why? Because when the air pressure drops, you can be unconscious in three to five seconds. So you need to take care of the other person first. That's what we're talking about with soul care, that, that we need to take care of, sorry, take care of yourself first, then take care of the other person. Like I, like I said, listen to what I mean, not what I say. Um, <laughs> But we take, what, what, are, what are we doing? We're making sure that we're healthy so that we can help other people. Listen, listen, it is so critical. It, it's so, in the United States, one of the great strengths is that we believe in the rights of individuals and we believe in individual freedom. It's a, a wonderful strength. But with every strength, there comes a weakness. And the weakness that we have as a culture is that we believe that if we do take care of ourselves, everybody else is responsible to take care of themselves. And if we all do that, we'll all be happy. But the reality is 
that we have a responsibility to the people around us. We can only help other people as we're healthy. And our help to other people will be directly related to our spiritual health. Does that make sense? So you and I have to make sure that our relationship with God is solid so that we can provide spiritual leadership, spiritual input to other people. God has called us to serve and to lead. So what is, how does Jesus model that in this setting, in John chapter 13, in this last supper with his disciples? I see a couple of things. I want to just focus on those this, this morning, and then we're going to come to the Lord's table in a bit of a unique way, a way that we haven't done it for a while. But the two things that I see that Jesus exhibited, first, I see a humility that produced service. It's so interesting in this text. Jesus finds himself as the most powerful person in the room. We read it in John 13 and verse 3. Jesus knew, this is so interesting, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that's incredible power. There are really no exceptions here. God had put, the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. In other words, Jesus had all power, he knew who he was, and he knew where he was going. He had nothing to lose. And he had all power. Think about that for just a moment. He had every option. What would you do if you had all power and you knew you had nothing to lose? I can think of a few things I'd do. It's probably why God hasn't given me all power. You're probably running through a few things too that you might do. And there are good things. You, you could do things militarily. You could do things socially. You could do things politically. You could do things culturally. Think of the things that you could do. What did Jesus choose? when he found himself as the most powerful person in the room, when he found himself with no limitations, he had all power. He'd come from God. He was returning to God. What did he choose to do? He chose humble service. We read on in verse 4. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, he, what that means is he, he took the place and the position and the clothing of a servant. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. This is, this is the hallmark of following Jesus, that we don't see power as something to be grasped. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not, regard, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. What did Jesus do when he had all power? He chose to serve. He chose humility and service. The second thing that I see that Jesus did was that he had a love. He not only had a humility that produced service, but he had a love that produced sacrifice. The description of this meal is really, really interesting. Let me reread in John chapter 13, verse 23. This is the text after the text that we read earlier. Later in the chapter, continuing description of what happened. John chapter 13, verse 23. Lying back on Jesus' chest was one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. It's interesting, the apostle John referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved, which is just fascinating to me. Um, I wonder if it bugged the other disciples. I don't know. But 
verse 24. So Simon Peter nodded to this disciple, nodded to John, and said to him, tell us who it is of whom he's speaking. And Jesus had just said, the one for whom I dip the bread will be the one who betrays me. In retrospect, we know that it was Judas. The disciples didn't know who Jesus was talking about. So Peter nods at John and says, tell us who it is of whom he's speaking. Verse 25, John then simply leaned back on Jesus' chest and said to him, Lord, who is it? So we see this, this interesting description of the Lord's Supper. And we have westernized, and, and uh, Leonardo da Vinci was a, an incredibly brilliant person, but he really messed us up about the Lord's Supper with his picture. Uh, somebody said the last thing, it's not recorded in the scripture, but the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples before the Lord's Supper was, hey, everybody get on this side of the table so we can take a picture. <laughs> That's really not what he said. But we see uh, da Vinci's picture of the, the Last Supper. This is not uh, a very faithful reproduction of what things actually looked like. In the Middle East in this time, uh, they didn't have tables like this. Most of their tables were at ground level. And I, I, I don't know the source of this picture that I want to share with you. Uh, I got it from uh, Rabbi Jerry Feldman, who's part of our fellowship here in, in the state, uh, after he had heard me talk about this. But there's a second picture, and I, I apologize, this picture is not nearly as, as artistic but it really is probably a better portrayal of how meals were shared during this time. And apparently, uh, what was happening? So when, when, they would, <clears throat> when they would share a meal, they would put their head, they would, the table, as you can see, is just a few inches off the floor, and they would lean on their left elbow, typically, and their head would be toward the table. So they're essentially lying on the floor. That's how, when you remember the story of the woman who came and washed Jesus' feet? And if you just read that story from our Western context, you'd have to put her under the table crawling around and able to wash Jesus' feet and dry them. You remember that story? She anointed, uh, washed his, his uh, feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. The, the way that that could happen is in this kind of a situation where Jesus' feet would have been extending out from the table. And to us, it looks very unnatural and all those kinds of things, but John really paints an incredible picture here. So Peter was across the table from John. John was in a position where he's on his left elbow, and Jesus would have been just to, as he uh, would have been to John's back. And John, to speak to Jesus, would have just leaned back and put his head on his chest and asked him the question, Lord, who are you speaking of? In verse 26 of this chapter says, Jesus then answered, as John is leaning back on Jesus' chest, that man is the one for whom I dip the piece of bread and give it to him. So when Jesus had dipped the piece of bread, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Jesus took this morsel of bread and dipped it in the cup and handed it to Judas. And we can assume that when Jesus did that, that his head would have rested on Judas' chest. And in fact, according to the culture of the day, Judas would have been in a place of honor at Jesus' side. It was this intimate, intimate moment where the disciples would have been honoring each other and dipping the bread and handing it to each other.
And in that moment, Jesus says, this, this is different than what we did in the Passover. He, he said, this cup is my blood. This bread is my body. This is a new covenant. In the midst of that holy moment, we see John record that Satan had already entered into Judas. It was this moment of intimacy, and yet it's this moment also of, of intensity. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. Yet his sacrificial love is even more intense than, than the moment. This ultimate betrayal and this ultimate disrespect. The love and grace and holiness of God himself dragged through the mud of spite, and greed, and, and betrayal. This holy moment disrupted by sin. And when, when Jesus shared these words. He wasn't talking in code when he said that man is the one for whom I shall dip the piece of bread and give it to him. He wasn't talking in code. Jesus is saying, my betrayer is the one that I'm giving my life for. My betrayer is the one that I'm giving. I'm offering my life for the one who betrays me. I'm offering it before he betrays me. I'm offering I'm offering forgiveness before he sins. And that's the sacrificial love of God. You know, as, as we read stories in, in the Bible, it's good, a good practice to imagine those scenes. And not just kind of read over it, gloss over it, but imagine the scene and even to imagine ourselves in the picture. And as I imagine myself in this picture, and I put myself in the scene, I realize that I'm Judas. I've failed Jesus. I've betrayed him. I have darkness in my heart. And in that moment, he lays his head on my chest and offers me forgiveness. And that's what he does for every one of us. Peter says he was like a sheep that was led to the slaughter. Silent. And that's the way we have to approach the Lord's table with humility and love. Humility that leads us to service and love that leads us to sacrifice. Humility that leads us to to service of God and of other people, humility that, or love that leads us to sacrifice for God and for other people. So as we come to the Lord's table this morning, I'm going to ask those who are helping with the serving to come at this time. As we come to the Lord's table, we're going to do things a, a little bit differently, and I'll explain that in, in just a moment. But when we come to the Lord's table, I wonder what is God speaking to you this morning? Is there a sacrifice that he's calling you to make? Is there service that he's calling you to? Is God speaking to you in some ways as, as Jesus offers you forgiveness? Have you really received that? as we prepare our hearts to come and, and commune with the Lord and with each other.
Is there anything in your life that stands between you and the Savior? As God extends himself to us in Christ, in humility, and in love, is there anything that you need to offer to him? In just a moment, we're going to pray. And once we've prayed, I'm going to invite you to slip out from where you are. And, and the people who are in at, at the front of each section, what I'm going to ask you to do is to file out to your right, to my left, and come and receive the elements. And then you can partake of the elements right here if you'd like to, or you can take them back to your seat. If you take them back to your seat, just make sure that you have, have a hand under the bread and juice so that it's, it doesn't get messy. But you can come and, and receive the elements. If, uh, if you're uncomfortable, we'll, what we'll do is we'll offer the bread to you. You can tear off a piece of the bread and dip it in the cup. If you're uncomfortable with that, and we certainly understand that there are also packets that you can just take. You can take and, and uh, open the packet, return to your seat and open the packet. And I say all of that just so that I, I hope that you're comfortable with with what we're doing because we want to take a moment this morning as, as we've been praying as a staff, as uh, leadership, as elders, we've been praying toward this morning. We've really realized that it's aimed at this very moment. I know that a lot of times in the service, we'll have a response time where we'll, we'll invite people to maybe raise their hand, maybe place a hand over their heart, making a commitment to Christ, maybe uh, offering something to him. And that's really what this moment is about as we come and, and share in communion. That's what this moment is about, that you would, whatever it is that God needs to do in your heart and life this morning, it would happen right here at the table. As the Lord offers himself to us in sacrificial humility and love. It's more than a ritual. It's a reality that we experience together. So let me read from the scripture. We'll pray and then we'll invite you to come and partake. And, and uh, as you receive the bread and the cup, be reminded this is the Lord's body, which is broken for you. This is the cup that was shed for you. Paul wrote and said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats of the bread or drinks of the cup in an unworthy way shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a person must examine himself, and in so doing, he's to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For the one who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not properly recognize the body. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. What's Paul saying? He's saying, this is real and this is important. And this is a holy moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. We thank you for his suffering. We thank you, Lord, that by his suffering and by his shed blood, we can know forgiveness. And we can know the wholeness that you offer to us. And so, Lord, we come to you this morning recognizing that you have offered your forgiveness. You'd offer, you've offered us your love. In this moment of time, Lord, we come to you and we say, thank you for your sacrifice. We confess our sin to you. We receive you in a fresh way as our Savior, as our healer, as the one who makes us whole. We receive you afresh into our lives. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. 
in the mighty and precious name of Christ. We acknowledge you as King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. 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 Would you stand? As you stand, would you come and receive the bread and the cup together? We'll continue to worship. The worship team will lead us.